The Mitch LaFon and Jeremy White Show. The Mitch LaFon and Jeremy White Show. Available wherever you stream. Catch up on past interviews and episodes on demand now. Subscribe so you don't miss any of it. Uh, let's get right into this. Our next guests are part of the one of the greatest rock and roll bands of all time. Their latest record, Dog Roll, coming out on September 30th. You can pre-order it now wherever you get your music. Joey's going to be joining us in just a moment. But welcome to the show. For the first time, the one and only David Lovering from Pixies. How you doing, David? Very good, Jeremy, and you're too kind in that introduction. Thank you so much. Well, we're thrilled to have you. First of all, yeah. I just want to compliment you on this new record that's coming out. Uh, the production of the record sounds absolutely brilliant. Your drums sound phenomenal. Oh, I, I, I think it might actually be my favorite drum kit on a record in 2022 because uh, we always say it could take a it takes a really shitty engineer to make a good song sound like shit. And <laughs> this new record just it sounds phenomenal. Uh, yeah. Talk a little bit about the recording before we talk about the rec- the songwriting process and stuff. Like, uh, what was the recording aspect like? But, that, but thank you, Jeremy. Um, I mean, I, I agree. I, it's one of my favorite sounding ones, the way sonically it is and everything like, yeah. that, and everything like that. Yeah. And I think the musicianship, we, we played very, very well on this one. I mean, we uh, this is our one, two, three, maybe our fourth one where Tom Del Getty was our producer on it. Yeah. And over the years, he's gotten to know the band more and more and more and more. And it's, it's worked out extremely well. I mean, we... With a producer, you have to relegate everything to him. Let him pick the songs and this and that. And we had about, I think, 40 songs going into this. At least Charles did or Black Francis. Right. Wow. And you just, again, you relegate it to all, uh, to Tom, what songs we're going to do. And it was nice with this one because we had enough time to really hone these songs and work and actually know how I'm going to play the drums, especially for me as a slow learner. It, mm-hmm. it it came together really kind of quick, so I'm very, very happy with that. And this, it was just a, a joy of, as an experience in the studio, which was in February of this year in Vermont. Oh, wow. And um, everything just, it was great. I think we, we can all agree as far as a band that we all played well and the way it was recorded recorded and the sonic sound of it, I think we're all very, very happy. Yeah, who'd have thought you could get a good drum sound in Vermont of all places? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it was luckily, I mean, it was the uh, studio's kit. I didn't use my kit, but um, oh, wow. yeah, I pulled it off with that. So yeah, I'm quite happy. So, yeah, I love the snare sound because it's almost you almost got like like it's a very ambient kind of drum. Sound. Like you listen to the snare, and it almost sounds like a Def Leppard kind of slap clap like kind of snare on a couple <laughs> of the tracks. Like you got, they utilize the room really well. Does the band get together in the room and track it live, or is it like an overdub kind of thing? We'll track it live as, as far as as much as we can. What we did was we knew these songs from trading them back and forth for about two months beforehand. Uh, when we went to the studio every every day before we would record, we'd set up a kind of a little like a baby kit, you know, baby amplifiers and kit. Yeah. in the uh, his residential area. So we could just kind of just get it into our heads and then we'd move to the studio and record it like that. So it, it and we again, we do it as much as we can track. But I mean, I think the, the, the real goal is get the drums and the bass down, get the foundation and then go from there and add on. Yeah. It's always what was, easier to build on a foundation. Yeah. What was the biggest difference between the studio kit and the kit you, you know, use at home or on the road? Like, was it your preference or? No, it was... I was relegated to a, it was a DW kit, but the kick drum was like a cannon. It was, mm. it must have been four foot long or something like that. But <laughs> Really? What was interesting, Jeremy, is um, the, the, the studio in the res- residential area, you weren't allowed to wear shoes. It was one of these, you know, you take your shoes off before you go in. Was it Mutt Lang Studio? Jeez. Oh, no, we it, got it, Joey it coming in. studio in Vermont. And um, yeah. what was interesting about it was when I went to the kit, I mean, I didn't put on shoes. I just played in my socks. And the pedal that that was with the kit was called a Tama Speed Cobra. Oh, yeah. And this this is not a kit that I, not a pedal that I play all the time. Because it's so, it's more for metal drummers. Yeah, that they're really like, loose. <laughs> yeah, the beater's very. Yeah. yeah. But without shoes on, I absolutely loved it. And I just had a, I had a blast. And it was so easy to play. So I'm thankful that kit was there with that hardware. That's super yeah, cool, actually, because uh, Alex... Joey's going to join us. There he is. Oh, there he is. Hey, what's up, Joey? How you doing? Hey, 
Well, hey, just before uh, we get to Joe, hey, I just want to ask uh, Dave or David one question. Uh, we are both in Canada, Jeremy and I, and it is September 12th, the day that Neil Peart was, uh, or Peart was born. You're a big Rush fan. Wow. Yeah. Right. So, so you know, welcome to our to our world. As we're talking um, about drums, I mean, talk about Neil a little bit. Yeah, I mean, oh. what attracted you to Neil, and and you, in terms of your playing, in terms of why you just went, whoa, okay, I got to follow this guy. Well, I mean, as a, as a youth, I mean, um, and Rush Rush were and still are a major part of my life. Um, okay. The musicianship, uh, especially Neil, you know, being a drummer and. Um, I got. I got to say, if you listen to early Pixies records, mm -hmm. I was quite busy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I wonder whose fault that was. But I was busy, and it wasn't until I think a few years into it, I said, "I got to be less is more." I think not doing this pert way is something that I'm doing. But, yeah. but yeah, but he was a major, major influence, and it was uh, yeah. I can't say enough about it. What was it about his playing, though? Because, I mean, you can look at so many different drummers that could potentially influence you style-wise, even, like, just the way you attack it. I mean, you could look at Alex Van Halen and want, like, a giant drum kit, but then you'd look at, I mean, John Bonham, and Alex is basically playing the John Bonham parts on a bigger yeah. kit. Neil had this very special thing to his playing. I mean, what was it about his his playing that you gravitated towards? Well, I mean, the technicality of what he was doing. And he played parts. I mean, he worked on the, the construction of what he was going to play in accordance with what the song was. I mean, I mean, drummers do that. They'll, they'll, you know, not step on the vocals and things like that. But he had actual parts that he would work out that were, I mean, a non-human a non could, I mean, no one could play them but him. And it just made it incredibly wonderful to listen to, to any, any Rush song. It was just so well constructed and so yeah. well thought out. No, totally. I mean, you listen to YYZ to, uh, you know, subdivisions and those parts are just so tasty. But if they're not there, the song's not the same. <laughs> yeah, 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 I know. I mean, he he made it. He made it. We're talking to David Lovering and Joey Santiago from Pixies. Brand new record, Dog Roll, coming out on September 30th. You can pre-order it now wherever you get your music. Also going to be hitting the road and stuff. Make sure you go and catch them. Uh, Joey, we we're just talking about the recording process of the new record uh, before you joined in. Uh, talk a little bit about that. I mean, some of the tones you're getting on this record, phenomenal stuff. I was I was telling David, like, it's one of the best produced and engineered records that I've heard this year. And yeah. I, I just got to compliment Brilliant. you on the tones that we're getting. Oh, oh thanks. Um, the tones. The tones are, um, uh, they're pretty, uh, um, Tom and I would have, the, like, the same idea, you know. Right. We would know the guitar, we would know the amp, we wouldn't know what pedal to use. And it's pretty, um, you know, we kind of have the same mind. He would be faster at getting the sounds. Yeah. You know, there are sometimes he'll surprise me with uh, uh, a pedal. Usually we'll have three pedals and we would know which one it is. It's like mm -hmm. this one, you know, cause it's the last thing to go on the recording. Mm -hmm. And we know what's going to fit in there. Yeah. Are you guys recording it like raw and then processing it afterwards? Or is it all no. like off the floor? No. That's what's going to tape. Not at all. We record uh, the delays. We, we, we record the echo room. Mm. It's, it's, it's pretty impressive the way he does it. We commit wow. to the, uh, yeah. to the, um, to the process. To you guys process. like to live dangerously. I know. <laughs> Especially in yeah. 2022. Yeah. Uh, Joey, mm -hmm. let me ask you about the song Dregs of Wine. Um, mm -hmm. You brought that in. Talk to me about, about bringing that in and, of course, how uh, Charles turned it into what he did lyrically. Well, this is what happened to that song. I had the guitar and I was over here playing. And my girlfriend's in that couch over there. It's over there. Right. The couch. Way over there. Perfect. She just it, and she's just hanging it out, you know, and she likes when I play. And I'm start, I started developing stuff. And, well, fuck it. I'll start making sense for this. And then, <laughs> um, and she recorded me. And because uh, every time I put on the guitar, I just go, you know. And then she, and then she played it back. I go, "Oh, you spy, you!" And and and, um, and I heard it, and I go, oh, "God damn, that's that's pretty good," you know. And then I started, you know, um, 
bring, having a, I started giving it to Tom. Mm -hmm. Right. I seriously was afraid to give it to Charles because it was like I didn't want to step on his toes. Uh And then when I was uh, in Boston visiting my brothers, well, Western Mass, I visited our manager in um, Connecticut. He had an acoustic guitar. I go, hey, let me play you this stuff. And I played it to him, and he goes, "Oh my God, this is really good." So I go, "All right, well, there you go. We'll record it." Yeah, it's amazing how a song could just come out of you know somebody creeping on you in the corner of a room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but I I, I want to know about the Van Halen name check in there because uh, the story talks about how uh, his ex wife preferred the Van Halen version of "You Really Got Me Now." Which, which we know is the superior version, let's be honest Which, here. Which it is. So uh, you're in a band with a guy who doesn't prefer the Van Halen version. Have you thought of breaking up again? <laughs> That's a joke. That was a very joke. <laughs> no, that was a joke. No, but uh, talk to me about, about the, the lyrical content. And, but as a Van, as myself as a Van Halen fan, were you both Van Halen fans? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah, one and two. Absolutely. Right. Uh, it was like blown away at this playing. It was incredible. The tone, fuck, that just came out of nowhere. He was the first one. First one. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you about this. You, we've got a Rush fan in front of us. We've got Van Halen fans. Pixies, to me, isn't that kind of music. It's, it's its own thing. I mean, to me, you're really your own genre. You're, you, there's mm-hmm. nobody else that does Pixies, right? Yeah. Uh, how did you end up doing the music you do? Why did you not become another Bon Jovi or another Def Leppard? Or because you have that the big rock influence. How did you turn into the Pixies? Uh, uh, Dave, you want to answer that? Well, I think it's it's. I mean, uh, all, the songs are mainly all well, Charles's songs or Black Francis, I should say. So right. there was that direction with that, and okay. I think it was all just our individual backgrounds like you're saying like i'm saying rush and stuff like that where i was busy and and joe and and kim and now pause and stuff like that we all we have our our ways as far as musicians and i think that's what just combined and just pixies (laughs) yeah it's hard to explain yeah Yeah, and and, go ahead go ahead mitch i was just gonna say and, and joey what about you in terms of how you approach the guitar in the pixies have you thought of of bringing in more you know, blistering solos and more, you know, more Eddie kind of influence guitar? Or do you just sort of say, you know what? These songs take something different and I'll just give them that. I do think about like, you know, being more technical. Right. You know, maybe in the next one. Uh, but I enjoy melodic stuff. Uh, my brain can't... Uh, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm very, very... Uh, impressed by uh technicality i love it but uh for me to able to do that would be i mean i'll try it but i like the melodies better yeah you know you know what i did for this album was i did i did the i i i read uh pat Maffini um um, interview and he said if you want to come up with a melody a nice hook melody uh write it in one string yeah so that's what i did and then obviously for live i had to like you know stack them you know but um but that's how it starts yeah and that's how you stop judging for myself that i'm in a box right you know because yeah, i mean- stay away from the box and sometimes oh shit, man i'm, I'm in a box but there are other times there's one solo that wasn't in the box at all. It went a triangular step, mm-hmm. which was all right. It's 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 in me, you know. Even though I was doing it in one string. Well, I mean, you look at Eddie Van Halen, and everybody knows, you know, the solo for "On Fire" or uh, you know, the eruption. Was, the eruption. And then he goes and writes an incredibly melodic song like "Dreams," and people are like, is this the same guy? But you have the gunslinging technical. Part of the playing, but then you also yeah. got the musicianship that knows how to write a melody. Mm-hmm. I'm more of the melodic guy as well. That's why I love bands like Def Leppard and like you know Van Halen. Obviously, with the Sammy stuff, way more melodic than the Dave years. But you, you, know, you know, I did I did do tapping. 
I did fret tapping. Oh, did on really? The, on, on the song Trump Lamont. Oh, did you? Yeah. Now, were you basing it off of Steve Hackett or were you basing it off of Eddie Van Halen? That's what I want to know. I was basing it off a fucking review we got from Bossa Nova that I was very basic. No, they called you yeah. basic? Not basic. It was like something. <laughs> I'm sensitive, you know? So it yeah, might have yeah. been it might have been a compliment. But to yeah. me, I took it like, oh, you, you know? So, <laughs> Son of a so bitch. I was just looking for any excuse to... Um, to kind of do the uh, the tapping, and it's on there. You'll hear it. Yeah, I got to go back and listen to that now. Yeah, yeah. Let, yeah. Me, let me ask both of you, and I'll start with you, Joey. In terms of reviews, since you bring up reviews, does it really matter? Because I've I've been a Kiss fan and a Van Halen fan and Cheap Trick and Peter Gabriel, and then the, you see all these horrible reviews, and I don't care. I mean, I, who cares? If my ears oh, yeah. like it, my ears like it. But do, but. Does it bother you? I don't get I remember, I I recall when Miss You came out by the Rolling Stones and they got panned. Yeah. It's fucking, it's a great record now. Fucking awesome you know? record. Come on. It, it was always a great record. But it was like, why? You know? So maybe that had an influence on I don't give a crap. And I yeah. don't. Yeah. yeah. You know? I mean, my, my ears well, are you my know, reviewer. Well, then again, what did I just say earlier? Right, you got, <laughs> yeah, you, but you know you what? Were, not all of them can get to you. One every now and then you'll get yeah, one review. You'll get one Facebook what I'm comment. Saying is, you know, I lie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, da and David, how about you? Do 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 do, do what guys like me write bother you? I mean, it should. Not, no, I take it with a grain of salt. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, yeah, I take it with a grain of salt. Whatever it is, I don't take it too 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 to the heart. Um, right. It's nice to read it. Sometimes it'll give you maybe some insight of things, maybe if it is possibly true or whatever. And it, it just, it reminds me of one thing. When Doolittle came out, yeah. Rolling Stone gave it three stars. And then it wasn't until we were formed, I think in 2004 or around that time that they took back what they had said and they gave it five stars. <laughs> so... <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what to believe in reviews. Uh, yeah, but, and, and let's not forget, Rolling Stone has given Yoko Ono five stars on every single album, so. Uh, <laughs> that's all you need to know, right? Uh, Pixies, brand new record Doggerel coming out on September 30th. Pre-order right now, wherever you get your music. Uh, we were talking at the beginning of this interview just about the drum sound and stuff on this latest record. Of course, you work with some incredible producers and engineers over the years. Uh, I, I just always wanted to know because... I'm a huge Steve Albini fan, and the drum sound he got on Surfa Rosa is just one of my favorite drum sounds of all time. And I just want to know if you have any, like, fun tales about working with Steve during those sessions and how you guys got that drum sound. Yeah. Well, the drum sound is basically a large room that all of us were in. Not only the drums, but all the guitars and everything. And what Steve did is we, you know, you, you mic the drums as usual. There's, there's uh, overheads. Mm -hmm. There were a drum and the kick drum, the snare. But what made it that kind of ambient sound? It was a PZM, which is a, 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 a placement zone microphone, which is kind of a it's kind of a square. And he mounted it on the wall as far away on the other side of the studio. Really? So you can have all the drums and whatever you're mixing. They sound great because they're close mics. But if you turn up that PZM microphone, it has a certain characteristic which gave it that that kind of, how would you say, the raw, that ambient sound? Yeah, it's got like a raw, ambient, kind of like roomy sound. It sounds like you're in the yeah. room almost. Yeah, but that was it. It was a PZM microphone, which did 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 that did that magic. Yeah. Steve's just one of the great engineers, man, like through the years. I mean, some of the records that he's done, but I always love the sound of that. My buddy Adam wanted me to ask you that question. I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot he did Surfa Rosa. Yeah. And Joe, didn't, didn't he ask you guys to use metal picks as well? Oh. oh. For more attack. Maybe, but I didn't do it. No. <laughs> yeah. That's the Def Leppard Mott Lang trick right there. He got the, yeah. the guys to use a metal pick on Hysteria, and that's how you got that attack on this, the tone. Great attack. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, let me ask you in terms of the song right here. Take Five by Dave Brubick. Listen to that drum sound. It's got that boomy room sound, too. The drum solo, the little drum solo, the drum break on that. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, there's nobody Incredible. makes. Dude, nobody records drums like that anymore. Everybody's drums is all addictive drums, all the same drum samples. So when you hear like a good sounding drum track or guitars these days, you, you can't go wrong with it. Yeah, yeah. I heard like, you know, uh, Jimmy uh, Bonham's kit was like three microphones. Yeah, in a stairwell. You know, 
<laughs> yeah, in a stairwell, you know. Now the like, drums look like it's like, you know, it looks like you're miking up presidential speech or something, you know? Right. It's, and there's too many microphones. Well, you got to remember back in the day, they only had, you know, four or eight tracks and you had to try and get the best sound you could to tape. Now it's all plugins. If you want the, uh, the stairwell at the power station, you got the Bob Clear Mountain plug-in, you know, yeah. <laughs> you've got, right. you got everything at your disposal now. Back then you kind of had to be experimental to get what you wanted. Mm -hmm. you didn't really have much did, did you guys now. experiment a lot in the studio when you guys were making your records or was it just really straightforward I think we in recording techniques or yeah recording. like you know miking up an amp like oh you know what let's put the let's put an sm57 on the cone or maybe this microphone sounds better would you would you fuck around with the tones like that or nah. no it was we very straightforward pretty straightforward we weren't like razor blade or um put razor blades on our uh, speakers. Right. You know, because, um, I don't know. It's an expensive process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it kind of is. I want to ask you about the songwriting for this album. Normally you come in with, with bits and pieces and you sort of construct it together. This time uh, he came in or, or, or Charles came in with sort of 40 songs. And then you had to pick and choose. How did you go through that process? And, and how complete were these 40 songs? Were, were they sort of done and you just had to, like at a buffet, pick out what you want? Or, or did you sort of say, okay, we need to work on these? I'll go with you first, uh, Joey. Well, no, uh, it was, we, we left it up to Tom, the okay. producer, you know, because he's the one recording it. He's the one that has to have the little joy in it. And we like all the songs, so he'll pick them. We'll miss some of them. But we can always revisit that later, you know, because it has to have some kind of theme. We're too close, you know, Charles is too close to it. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, you need someone with uh, a bird's eye view of the process. Is it a pain in the ass to have a producer, though, like that? You know, like picking all the songs, like, at the end of the day, doesn't the band know what the band is supposed to sound like? Well, yeah. But David? But a band... Yeah, I, I yeah. And it's it's nice to like like Joe said. It's nice to relegate it to to a, to a producer because th that's you know we do what our job is as far as a band, and he right. does his job as far as production, and the engineer does his job, and they're the best at what they do. So why not you know just offer that to him? And especially since we've been we've worked with Tom for the last I think this will be the fourth album that we've done with him. Mm -hmm. So he knows us. He knows what we're about and, and things like that, that are, I think, valuable, that really let us kind of relegate it to him to pick those songs. Yeah. Let me ask this you this. going to be the death of every band, but, you yeah. know, I'm not comparing ourselves to the Beatles. This is just right. what happened to Abbey Road. When Let It Be was recorded, um, afterwards, George Martin came in. You want to do another record with me? You're going to do what I say. Right. You know, you, it's, it's, it, you have to just trust me. And they, that's, that's Abbey Road. Let it be good record, but it was all over the place, wasn't it? Yeah. It? Yeah. So. Well, hey, so I guess let me you got to this, Joey, because in this day and age, a lot of bands, you know, they have the home studio and, and more and more records are self-produced. Everybody mm -hmm. does their own record. And I always say, I think you need some outside ears for perspective. Uh, why are the Pixies not self-producing and, and why do you bring in the outside ears? Because, I mean, you're obviously talented enough to know what a good yeah. song is. You, you know how to work a studio. And why Tom, of all people? Yeah, why Tom? No. No, but, uh, but, but, but talk to me about that. I don't know. I think it's just for uh, diplomacy. Okay. Yeah, that's one thing, you know. Um, it would be too many people in the pot, even right. though we, there are, there are, we know we, we will, we will, uh, have our two cents in with Tom, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. Yeah. And, and what about you, David? Uh, have you thought of saying to the guys, Hey, let, let's just produce the next one ourselves. I mean, we're, we've been in the business 40 years. We know what the hell we're doing. 
No, I don't think I've ever really, really thought about it that, even though I love electronics and recording and all that. But right. um, no, I just, I let the powers that be that know how to do it better. And um, and I try to do what I know best. And that, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Well, right. You got me thinking now. You, you want to produce the next one, don't you? No, I, I just want to just, just do it by accident, which is we're going to be – you know, I think Charles wants to record demos. Yeah. He does. And when we do it, let's just have this thing in mind that we want to uh, have it released and not have it half-baked. Mm -hmm. yeah. It never is. The demos are never half-baked, but, you know, think about it more in the, the final product. Yeah. Leave it a little bit more raw, a little bit less produced, a little bit yeah. more like, yeah, fuck it. Let's let's just do it, you know? I just called the song a product, didn't I? You did. You, <laughs> you did. did. You did. And, and, Very and, rock and all of you. And, and you know, the I Pixies watched, are a brand, right? I, I mean, watch a right? lot of cooking shows, and when they call their dish a product, it's like, <laughs> don't give me a product, man. Give me a fuck. Give, give me something good. Yeah, give I me a piece like, of art on a plate. Well, all right, here. Let me just quickly ask you that then, because we we often refer let's, to let's, bands let's, these let's, days let's as brands. That out and, and then, Scott, you know, when we when we um, yeah. you know when we finish our masterpiece, we will uh, yeah, whatever. I forgot. Let's just call it a fucking product. I don't care. Yeah, it, yeah. It is we, that's what it's going to be, right? You're selling the damn thing. Well, look, I mean, you are selling a product. You sell merch. You got the Pixies logo on stuff. You see kids today walking around with the T-shirts. I mean, it, it's 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 a product at the end of the day. The does, does, that, do. does that does that cheapen what you do if somebody says it's a product or that the Pixies are a brand? Does that, does that sort of cheapen it for you? Yeah, a little bit. I mean... I mean, we got branded in a way, mm -hmm. and it's uh, and sometimes, or, or maybe pigeonholed, right? And but you know, I guess I don't know. I don't know if I if if that's admittable. Yeah, because yeah, music is supposed to be wild and free, but at the end of the day. It's a it's, business. It's, it's incorporated. Music, yeah, it's the music <laughs> business, not the music hobby. You know, the, the hobby's yeah. not going to pay for the cars and the the guitars and the keyboards and the drums. You know, it's like it's yeah. Pay, Gene, Sim bills to pay. Gene, Gene Simmons is the king of branding. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just came back from Vegas. I went to his Kiss Museum in uh, the Rio <laughs> Hotel, and there was like a like I think one quarter of his whole collection there. And the the crazy shit that you'd see the Kiss logo on, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. And yeah, and it's, it's all sitting in a closet in my house somewhere. Somehow. Yeah, there you go. Well, listen, uh, the latest product from the Pixies, uh, <laughs> Dog Roll, <laughs> oh. on September 30th. You can pre-order it now wherever you get your music. Uh, as an absolute thrill to talk to you guys. This is super, super fun. David, Joey, uh, all the best with the latest record. You're welcome back to the show anytime. Hopefully we'll catch you on a show uh, sometime soon. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, man. Don't, Check don't you want to add in that they're one of the greatest brands in rock today? There you get one of the greatest brands. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Hopefully, we'll see right. you in Montreal very soon. Oh, yeah. Sure. Looking forward Montreal. to it. Take Cheers. care. All right. All right. Bye. See you guys later. Bye. Bye, Bye. The Mitch LaFon and Jeremy White Show. The Mitch LaFon and Jeremy White Show. Available wherever you stream. Catch up on past interviews and episodes on demand now. Subscribe so you don't miss any of it.